The campaign is ending. Candidate Truman, apparently the only American unwilling to concede the defeat unanimously predicted for him, winds up his grueling campaign in New York. A Dewey victory is in the air, and the Republican campaign windup, also in New York, seems more like a victory rally than an election drive. The Democrats are conceded an outside chance only in the Senate, where Republican candidates, like Minnesota's incumbent Joseph Ball, are being forced into strenuous last-minute stumping by underdog Democratic rivals like the 37-year-old mayor of Minneapolis, Hubert Humphrey, Jr. Warner Pathé cameras exclusively record the Senate races in the key states. The Tennessee campaign of former GOP committee head Carol Reese is enlivened by Roy Acuff's Smoky Mountain Boys. Opposing Reese is Estes Kafova, unknown until he was nominated, despite Memphis boss Crump's opposition. No voters are neglected. Republican Patrick Hurley uses an interpreter to appeal to the Spanish-speaking citizens of New Mexico. The former Secretary of War is vigorously opposed by Clinton Anderson, until recently the Secretary of Agriculture. 32 of the Senate's 96 seats are at stake. But in states like Illinois, untried Democratic contenders like Paul Douglas, a university professor, are given little chance against Republican veterans like Curly Brooks. At best, the Democrats hope for a two-seat Senate majority. Election morning ends the presentation of the case. A presidential jury goes out for the 41st time since 1789. It is a jury chosen regardless of race, color, creed, or sex. In city and town, in fair weather and foul, an estimated 45 million voters, perhaps a record number, go to the polls to exercise their heritage, the right to choose their president. Even the weather seems to be against President Truman as he goes to vote in Independence, Missouri. But that can't shake his confidence any more than do the opinion polls, which rate him no chance. Here's one vote he's absolutely sure of. And two others quickly follow as his wife and daughter cast their ballots. The election weather in Independence is no worse than it is in Paducah, Kentucky, where Senator Alvin Barkley, the Democratic vice presidential candidate, adds another sure vote to the Truman Bar Club. Governor and Mrs. Dewey, like President Truman, beaming and full of apparently justified confidence, arrive early at their election district in New York City. The other half of the Republicans' ticket, vice presidential candidate Earl Warren, with his wife, votes across the nation in Oakland, California. In the South, Governor Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, who heads the Southern Democrat states' rights ticket, votes in Edgefield. Minor party candidates like Norman Thomas, heading the socialist ticket for the sixth straight time, vote without fanfare. No one thinks they'll win, but the votes they get are expected to hurt Truman. As the polls close across the nation, New York's Times Square is almost deserted. The result is considered a foregone conclusion. Then comes the first hint of an upset in the making. Truman takes an early lead. In Dewey headquarters, the Democratic lead causes no alarm. Traditionally, the first votes are from Democratic cities. When New York's 47 electoral votes appear safely Republican, Dewey's campaign manager, Herbert Brownell, makes a jubilant announcement. We now know that Governor Dewey will carry New York State by at least 50,000 votes and that he will be the next president of the United States. <laughs> Democratic headquarters ignore Republican claims. Jim Farley and Howard McGrath, past and present party chiefs, watch Truman's surprising lead with cautious optimism. In Progressive Party headquarters, Henry Wallace hears the returns. His vote, while small, affects several states and delays any clear-cut presidential decision. But Senate victors become known. Mayor Humphrey wins, and Minnesota, considered safely Republican, soon goes to Truman. Estes Kafova easily wins in Tennessee for the Democrats. As the Senate returns pour in, one state after another falls into the Democratic column. In New Mexico, Democrat Clinton Anderson joins the victors. The magnitude of the upset becomes clear, as in Illinois, isolationist Republican Curly Brooks is unseated by Paul Douglas, never given a chance. 
Meanwhile, at Dewey headquarters, the Republican candidate and his family join millions across the nation in listening to the astounding returns. It's now certain that even should Dewey win, he'd have a Democratic Senate. Also close to his radio is Senator Barkley. The reports now point to the undreamed possibility that the Democrats may win control of the House. As the early morning hours drag on, party workers wonder if this can be the election the experts meant when they predicted Dewey's victory would be certain before midnight. It's now almost dawn, and everyone's having trouble staying awake. With Dixiecrat Thurmond carrying four states, all that's certain yet is that the race is so close that maybe no candidate will have a majority. For the first time since 1824, the presidency may be decided by the House of Representatives. For the moment, there's nothing to do but wait. The outcome now hinges on three pivotal states, Illinois, California, and Ohio. The lead in each has changed several times during the evening. Now again, it swings towards Truman. Dewey headquarters are thrown into deep gloom. The Democrats have captured the Senate and the supposedly impossible House. When the final break comes, it's from Ohio, the state called the mother of presidents. At 11.14 the next morning, with the outcome now certain, Thomas E. Dewey sends a message in keeping with the tradition of American democracy. I've sent the following wire to President Truman. My heartiest congratulations to you on your election and every good wish for a successful administration. I urge all Americans to unite behind you in support of every effort to keep our nation strong and free and to establish peace in the world. Democratic headquarters goes wild. It was a landslide, just as the experts predicted. Only it was democratic. In Missouri, friends and colleagues congratulate the man who engineered the most stunning political upset in U.S. history. And Americans of all political faiths join in saluting the man who didn't know when he was licked and then proved he was right, President Harry S. Truman. Here's return to Washington. President Truman and Senator Barkley, who led the Democrats to their amazing election landslide, ride in triumph from the Capitol down the famous mile and a half to the White House. A happy warrior returns the cheers of three quarters of a million Washingtonians, a turnout rivaling all others in Capitol history. This is the jubilant climax of the 30,000 grueling miles of campaigning of the uphill battle against odds that were called impossible. Now, back at the White House, back at what will be his residence for four more years, President Truman says, I shall look forward to help and cooperation of all the people because we are faced with great issues now which I think we can bring to a successful conclusion. To advance the cause of peace at home and abroad, Vice President-elect Barkley urges, Now that the election is over, and the result has been decisively determined, I hope that all of our people may be united and move forward to the accomplishment of these ends. I thank you very much, Mr. President, and all this great crowd of people. Two days later, the President flies to Key West, Florida. He is greeted by Captain Cecil Adele, Commandant of the Boca Chica Naval Submarine Base. Here, far from Washington rumors of administration shakeups and legislative programs to come, the President of the United States heads for a well-earned two-week vacation. Gaily bedecked Washington, jammed to overflowing, prepares for the Truman inaugural. In a hectic week celebrating his becoming president in his own right, Mr. Truman, really enjoying himself, tells Truman Barkley Club members... I'm in a rather embarrassing position. Both my bosses are sitting here at this uh, table. <laughs> the only two people in the world that I ever called boss, I still call Barkley boss, and I've always had for the last, as long as I can remember. <laughs> Senator Barkley and I have been going along with the Democratic Party ever since we can remember. And he's somewhat younger than I am. <laughs> uh, but I'll say this. 
realized that as long as I was a member of the United States Senate, when my leader in the United States Senate decided on a policy that the Democratic Party should pursue, I followed that leader in the pursuit of that policy, and I think that's a good plan. <laughs> Incidentally, I'm putting out a little propaganda. <laughs> At the Electoral College dinner on the eve of his taking oath, Mr. Truman, for the first time, tells how he spent the night of America's most surprising election. I had my sandwich and glass of buttermilk and went to bed at 6.30. And along about 12 o'clock, I happened to wake up for some reason, and the radio was turned on on the National Broadcasting Company. And Mr. Kelton Barn was saying, while the president is a million votes ahead in the popular vote, we have yet to hear from the very sure that when the country vote comes in, Mr. Truman will be defeated by an overwhelming majority. <laughs> and I went back to bed and went to sleep. About four o'clock in the morning, the chief of the Secret Service came in and said, Mr. President, I think you'd better get up and listen to the, the broadcast. <laughs> We've been listening all night. And I said, all right. And I turned the darn thing on, and <laughs> there was Mr. Kelton born again. <laughs> and then Mr. Harkness came on and analyzed the situation. I called the Secret Service men, and I said, we'd better go back to Kansas City. It looks as if I'm elected. <laughs> Along about 10 o'clock, I got a telegram which said that the, the uh, election was over and that uh, I should be congratulated on the fact that I had won the election. And uh, apparently it was too bad, but it happened. <laughs> Later that night, at the National Guard Auditorium, the President and his family are honored at a giant inaugural gala. The Whistle Stop Express, a reminder of the President's grueling campaign tours, brings in some of the 700 Hollywood stars who present the Entertainment World salute to the Trumans, one of the biggest shows in history. Inauguration morning. This is the day Harry Truman was supposed to be going back to Missouri. Instead, 130,000 see him, accompanied by Vice President-elect Barclay, enter Capitol Plaza for the 40th presidential inauguration since George Washington's 160 years ago. The president comes to the historic spot where presidents before him, here Woodrow Wilson, have stood and taken their oaths in exactly this position. A month after Wilson was inaugurated, America was forced into World War I. Here, Calvin Coolidge, in an era of fabulous prosperity, was sworn in to succeed himself. Here, in March 1929, at the peak of the prosperity, which seven months later came crashing down into the Depression, Herbert Hoover was inaugurated. Four years later, Franklin D. Roosevelt began the unprecedented four-term administration, which was to make him known and loved throughout the world. This was March 4th, 1933. Twelve years and one month later, on the eve of victory, Franklin Roosevelt died. Humble and heartbroken, Harry Truman, with tears in his eyes, repeated the presidential oath after Chief Justice Stone at a simple ceremony in the White House. The same Bible, open to Blessed Are the Peacemakers, again under his hand, now on Inauguration Day, 1949. So help you, God. So help me, God. Coming. Please place your hat 
on the Bible. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me, following oath. I, Alvin William Barclay. I, Alvin William Barclay. You solemnly swear. You solemnly swear that I will support and defend. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States against all enemies, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, our purpose of evasion, our purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office, discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter, upon which I am about to enter, so help me God. So help me God. program for peace and freedom will emphasize four major courses of action. First, we will continue to give unfaltering support to the United Nations and related agencies. And we will continue to search for ways to strengthen their authority and increase their effectiveness. We believe that the United Nations will be strengthened by the new nations which are being formed in lands now advancing towards self-government under democratic principles. Second, we will continue our programs for world economic recovery. Third, we will strengthen freedom-loving nations against the dangers of aggression. We are working out with a number of countries a joint agreement designed to strengthen the security of the North Atlantic area. Such an agreement would take the form of a collective defense arrangement within the terms of the United Nations Charter. The primary purpose of these agreements is to provide unmistakable proof of the joint determination of the free countries to resist armed attack from any quarter. Every country participating in these arrangements must contribute all it can to the common defense. We make it sufficiently clear in advance that any armed attack affecting our national security would be met with overwhelming force, the armed attack might never occur. Fourth, we must embark on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas. In his inaugural address, the president asks America to lead the way to a better world. He condemns communism as a false philosophy and calls for greater liberty around the world. Then, with Vice President Barclay, he leads the most spectacular inaugural parade in capital history down Constitution Avenue. Around his car march his artillery buddies of Battery D. Over a million and a quarter spectators jam every inch of the parade route. The Air Force salutes its Commander-in-Chief with a 650 plane review, the greatest aerial parade ever staged over the capital. 40,000, including all the nation's services, march in the parade, which stretches for seven miles and takes over three hours to pass the reviewing stand opposite the White House. Men and women throughout the democratic world join in saluting Harry S. Truman and Alvin W. Barclay, the President and Vice President of the United States. Thank you.